Hey guys and welcome to Q&A Monday and as you know the point of these videos is for me to answer questions that you have about everything from my time studying medicine and the engineering I'm currently studying to other fun things that I do in my life from charitable work to medtech products and all the other stuff that I do. So let's get to it and before I continue for those of you who don't know me yet, I'm Sen, I'm a fourth year medical student at Cambridge and before we begin with the questions make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you know when my videos are coming out. So enough chat, let's look at the questions that we've been asked. As always I get flooded with different um, people from all over the world every single um, every single day you know, asking questions. One of the key questions that quite a few people ask me is which part of Sri Lanka are you from and I'm from Trincomalee or my family is from Trincomalee. Uh, they've been there for quite a few generations now. I think before that they were in a place called Jaffna up north. The next question is, do most medical students at Cambridge take four A-levels or three A-levels? Because this person's currently debating about doing three or four. Now for Cambridge specifically, uh, generally if the fourth A-level is physics, it's quite useful to have. But if it's not physics, then I don't think it's as impressive. Now that said, I've got a friend at Jesus College who did art up to A level and you know Cambridge really loved that it seems. Um, I know Oxford, if you do four A levels, like to see a completely different A level like French or history along with the traditional math biochem. In general, most Cambridge students don't have four A levels. They've only got three and actually the entrance requirement is two A stars and an A. So even if they have three A levels, not all of them even get three A stars. Um, some of them get two A stars and an A. You know, at certain colleges, I find that, oh, well, particularly Jesus College anyway, in my year, a lot of the students I was surprised had four A stars at A level. You know, Cambridge say you need three A stars at A level and that's pretty competitive. Well, in my year, clearly that wasn't the case. And so for me, having offered four and given that other kids in my, you know, batch have got four as well at four A stars, I don't know, that speaks for itself, I think. The more you have, not only the more you have actually, the more you have and the more you do very well in, the stronger it comes off as. Because it just makes you look like a person who can do lots of things, but also do them very well. Which is practically the Cambridge course summarised. So yeah, maybe, maybe that answers your question. Are there any scholarships for international students to study medicine? So to give you some context, my perspective is from being a home student. So because I've lived both in Germany since I was born, and in the UK for the last around 15, 16 years, I am considered something called a home student, so I only pay around 9,000 pounds a year for my education at university. As an international student, things are very different, where you are charged, I think, around 30 plus K per year um, for university. Now, for some people, this is affordable, but for others, this isn't so affordable, and so looking at scholarships is a wise option. That said, you know, just because something costs a lot of money doesn't mean you should always pay it. For example, I know a lot of friends who've been to top boarding schools in the country and those fees can go up to £40,000 a year. But even then, even the wealthy ones, they've received scholarships to study there. What they pay at the end isn't the full-blown figure that you would see on the school prospectus. So similar to that, I think people's thinking is, are there any scholarships available for medicine? As far as I know, the international fee for medicine is fixed, unfortunately but there are other ways of subsidizing it. Now, from my experience, I've met a few students from countries like Germany, Poland, India, where the government actually gives scholarships to very, very gifted students. So let's say you're in Germany and you're a very, very bright student currently going through your gymnasium years. Now, if you want to apply to Oxbridge, uh, the thing is that you know the fees are still 9,000 pounds because you're in the EU, but in Germany, university fees don't really exist. So the government say to these students, well, you know, you're really bright, you're doing very well, and so we can give you a scholarship that covers all your fees, and that allows these students to then come to the UK and do three years of Cambridge degree, whilst not really paying anything themselves. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. They're very bright students, they've seen the opportunity of a scholarship, and they get a fantastic degree, whilst also saving some money whilst at it. So it's a very good idea for you to inquire with your school administration, and the education ministry maybe, whether there are any international student scholarships available. If not, then, you know, maybe look for a loan or something. But generally, all this confusion only applies to undergraduate studies. Usually, once you get to the postgraduate level of things, PhDs, for example, there are massive funding bodies, such as the Cambridge Trust, the Gates Scholarship, and, you know, there are multiple different organisations which simply fund people's PhDs. The next question is, how can I apply to Cambridge from India? 
Now let's sort of take this question a bit broader and sort of talk about how we can apply to Cambridge from any international country. So there are three key things that you should do. Number one, make sure you look at the website in detail for the course you're interested in and understand everything on it and really ensure you have the things that the you know course requirements ask for. There's no point applying for a course if you don't meet all the requirements that they've asked for. The second key step is to do some more broader research that's away from the university and actually see if you like Cambridge. So to do that, I'd recommend you watch some YouTube videos, go to some student forums. There are loads of even non-profit student run pages that talk about the Cambridge experience that share advice about applying to Cambridge. And so it's important that you not only look at the official Cambridge outlets for information, you also understand from a student's perspective what the university is like and what the courses are like, because you know, it's not too uncommon to hear students that have come to Cambridge thinking they're expecting something from a course and it turned out that course experience was completely different to what they expected. The third key step is understanding the deadlines. So every year there are some key deadlines for different courses. For the PhD students for example, you know, there are some significant deadlines for funding and for, you know, ensuring your project is put forward the um, chief PhD assessment I think, committee or something. So yeah, Look at the deadlines and understand them and make sure you apply on time. Don't be unprofessional and apply late because like nearly 100% of the time your application will get rejected. And so, you know, three key things, look at the university website and understand what's on there for your course. Do some wider research, understanding the student perspective on your course and getting information about that. Number three, looking at the deadlines and understanding what you need to submit and when you need to submit it and you know when you need to email a few people and get things moving. The next question is, since it's quarantine, what sort of journals should I be reading? Is The New Scientist a good journal to read, for example? Now to answer this question, it depends on what sort of medical school you're applying to. I know that um, applying to Cambridge, I realized the course was very scientifically rigorous. And so I was reading journals that are a bit off the beaten track amongst the student population at school, but they're very, very much, um, you know, the big journals in actual medicine. And these are The Lancet, the New England Journal of General Medicine. And these are all like big blockbuster journals in the world of medicine. Some students were reading The New Scientist, but for me personally, The New Scientist is like sort of scientific research plus a load of fluff. It's like 80% fluff and 20% scientific research. If you actually look in the world of research and academia and medicine, people read papers and they are like practically 100% facts and evidence-based stuff and they do studies and they look at the method and they analyze the method, they talk about whether it's a good method, a bad method, there's loads of interesting data in there. And you know, these sorts of studies are very, very high level. And so if you are applying to a university like Cambridge, then of course, you know, there's no need to know these studies at the back of your head, but just having an interest in sort of research grade papers and journals is very impressive. If you're applying to sort of what I consider normal medical schools that aren't as academic as Cambridge, then you know journals such as The New Scientist are plenty enough to show that you've done some wider reading. That said, you know, even applying to UCL, they asked me, you know, you read The Lancet, and although UCL isn't as academic on the forefront of things as Cambridge, they were clearly interested in the Lancet and that kind of reflects on UCL's research having skyrocketed in the last few years. So, you know, more and more medical schools might be impressed by high impact journals. So the new scientists and that caliber of journals, yeah, it's kind of okay. But if you want to be impressive, then look at proper research grade journals. Like I said, they need to know them all and understand them all. But if you read something, sort of rip it out, put it in a notebook and write some reflections on what you read. So if they do ask you about it in an interview, you can't talk about it and give a general overview of what you read and why you found it interesting. The next and last question is, how's your quarantine? Um, what a thoughtful question, so thank you. Um, well, my quarantine is going all right. It's been, what, six weeks? The UK government is thinking about lifting the lockdown. Um, I don't think it's gonna happen anytime too soon, but I think everyone's worrying about the economy crashing, so we could probably expect it about two weeks time. Um, I've been mainly focusing on my master's project and writing out my thesis. That's due in on the 27th of May, so I've been very busy with that. But also, you know, just spending time with family. And spending turn time at home is quite unusual because generally, right now, if things had gone normally, I would have been doing my fourth year master's exams and then been hectically putting together my 
thesis ahead of my submission date. So things have changed drastically and I'd say, you know, although coronavirus is out on the whole, as worrying as it has been, it has been nice to also spend time with family because I'm pretty sure that, you know, I won't get to spend this much time with my family ever again because once I start my clinical school rotations, the holidays get far, far shorter. I think you get like two, three week holidays till the end of med school. And once you finish med school, you practically start working soon after. And once you start working, you don't really get this much time off. So, you know, really cherishing this time we have and making the most of it. Yeah, and just goofing around really. And on the point of goofing around, if you notice, I do have a blue spot on my nose. And that was when I was coming back into the house, not having realized that the glass door uh, into the kitchen was closed. So I walked straight into it and now I've got a bruised nose, which is wonderful. My mother said earlier that this red nose enhances my facial complexion. So I'm not really sure what to say of that. Um, yeah, I think I'll go blue first, but yeah, that's my life. Goofing around, doing my masters and just, you know, making a few YouTube videos and, and getting on with life and hoping that I don't get coronavirus, but also that I don't get it and spread it to people. So stay indoors, kids, and, you know, keep working hard and reading books and listening to music and watching Netflix. So as always, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully this has been an interesting video. And yeah, as always, ask some comments down below in any video that I post, but also message me on Instagram. That's a really good way of reaching out to me. And even if I do reply at 3 a.m. in the morning, as I commonly do, you know, I've replied to you and I get in touch. But also I can share the good questions in these Q&A videos to share the questions you have, sometimes very, very good questions with a wider audience. And I need to get some sleep. It's nearly three o'clock in the morning again. Good night and bye-bye.